My name is Freighter Crow, and I've always experienced life a little different than most. The veil between the spiritual and physical planes have always been thinner for me than that of your average person. Since a child, I've had the gift to see, talk, and experience the presence of spirits and ghosts. I've used this ability to give voice to those that have passed and no longer are heard or seen by the masses. With my good friend and partner Daniel James, we will shed light onto so many topics and do our part to bring to the surface what often is hidden in darkness. My name is Daniel James. As early as I have memories, I have had sightings of UFOs, shadow people, beings from other realities, sleep paralysis, and a call to the unknown. My interests in the paranormal has led me into producing films, documentaries, and web series about all of the mysteries that I chase. Now, my journey has led me here. To share these stories with my partner Garrett, and with you. recent encounters suggest there might be more things in heaven and earth than we can dream of. So are werewolves just a Hollywood creation or do half man, half wolf creatures really exist? Now tonight we kick off our Conspiracy Theory Month series, which was a... The legend of the vampire actually goes back for centuries and it exists in some form or another in almost every culture. In fact, some people believe the first vampire story was in the Bible. Well, for decades, only crackpots and crazy people believed in UFOs. That's what I thought anyway. And then in recent years, it turns out that governments have been taking them seriously all along. Try and clear up an ancient mystery with the help of a common veterinarian who says she can prove that Bigfoot exists and that he's related to all of us. New reports by pilots coming forward over the weekend saying they've had multiple mid-air encounters with high-flying, fast-moving objects. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for tuning in to Season 4, Episode 3 of the hit underground radio occult show known as Pong, Pair of Normal Guys podcast brought to you by Celestial Oddities Radio. Um, Daniel, for some reason, I'm hearing an echo of everything I'm saying. Echo? Well, it wasn't there before. Guys, we're running a little late today because we've had a heck of a, a stint of technical difficulties, and it seems to be furthering. Um, it's it's always this show. For some reason, this show doesn't uh, want us to get our stuff out there. Now you're sideways, sir. Sideways, sir. <laughs> you got to hang on a second. <laughs> we'll just keep them like that. Yeah, the, con the controls on here are... Sometimes you have to dig around for them. We have people saying that they're not hearing the echo on their end, but I am certainly hearing the echo on mine, and I'm not sure why I would be. Let's try this. If I get rid of that, are you guys still hearing both of us correctly? Dan, say something. Yes. Test See, now you're gone. One, two, three. So if I get rid of your channel, I can't hear you. There's no echo. As soon as I bring you back, there's an echo. I'm not sure why. Okay, hang on. Hang on. Hi, Freighter. Hi, Sideways, Daniel. How about now? Let me see. Is it work now? Check, 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 check. Yeah, I think we're good. I don't hear myself anymore. Am I still sideways? For me, it's normal. No, you're normal now. You sound a little different than you did before. It sounds like a phone call, but that's okay. So we'll jump back real quick for a moment, guys. Welcome to Season 4, Episode 3 of the hit underground paranormal radio show known as Pong, Pair of Normal Guys podcast, brought to you by Celestial Oddities Radio. Um, as always, I am your host, Freighter Crow. And I'm your co-host, Daniel James. Now, today, Daniel's on his phone rather than his computer, because for some reason, as we talked about two episodes ago, the connection only when he's on this show 
yeah keeps failing and not letting him come through clearly he's breaking up it's skipping last week we our last episode we had a great episode no problems but the episode before that our season opener as some of you guys seen we experienced about a 10 minute patch of that and then everything Dancer else was shit. Fine. and then this episode it just wasn't working so that's why we were about 15 minutes late or 14 minutes late so we apologize but we're going to make do with what we have and run it so if you're listening out there whether you're listening live streaming after the fact or downloaded to your device for on the go we do want to thank you for your patronage and support make sure you click the like share follow and subscribe buttons on whatever platform you're tuning in from whether it be itunes iHeartRadio, spotify Deezer, Spreaker, CastBox, Google Play, Amazon, Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. We air across absolutely everywhere. So listen where you like, but by clicking those buttons, it moves us up the podcast community rankings, allows more people to discover the show, keeps you in the loop with new episodes as they air, and gives you unfiltered access to our past archives. Now, guys, if you are listening out there, I have a very special announcement because I told you I was contemplating whether or not I was going to end the radio portion of the show, and I have decided to do so. So going forward, this is the last episode where we will be on all of those platforms, and you'll hear me give that spiel that I have done for years. This is the last time. Our show will continue, but it will only be on the Daniel James Artist Facebook page, the Freighter Crow personal Facebook page, the Celestial Oddities radio Facebook page, as well as Knights of the Nephilim YouTube and Darkness and Divination Instagram Live. Um, the other at platforms will end. So the radio portion where you're only listening is audio and there's no video, that will be going away. And it'll just be Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. I know that we will probably lose some listeners because of that. I do know that that might be an inconvenience to some out there, and I apologize. But it's a lot to run two different dashboards at one time for starters. And the second thing is just merely cost of how much it costs per year um, to run both of them and do everything that we're doing. So kind of phasing out some of those things, such as those other stations, Knights of the Nephilim, which is the first time I'm bringing this public only has anywhere between four to six episodes left. And I am closing down that show. Uh, so, you know, if you're a fan of that show, make sure you ch check out the next four to six. And the reason I say four to six is simply because I have four guests locked in. The other two I'm waiting to hear back on. I decided to extend it. That was, we're going to be the last four of the season. Going to have another season next year. I decided not to do that. Add two on from next year that I really wanted. And if they say yes, we'll have six more episodes left and I will be closing that down. I do want to thank each and every one of you for your support over the years on that show. I, I love doing it, but it is time to put it to bed. My spirit guides are telling me that it's time to move on to some other ventures of mine. They were actually the reasons I got into it in the first place through ritual that I was told I needed to make a platform to spread occult knowledge. And uh, I've been told that it's time to hang that up. So we're going to go ahead and do that. But, uh, you know, make sure you like those episodes, share them around and enjoy them. And as far as this goes, we want to thank you for tuning in the last three episodes. We talked last episode about... What was our last episode? Our last episode was Russian Sleep Experience. That was our first one, wasn't it? That was our first one. Yeah. I'm confused now, Dan. It all blends together, brother. No, no, no. It was the UFO <laughs> stuff, like um, the mainstream media and extraterrestrial. Ah, yes, that's what it was. So first episode, folks, was the Russian sleep experiments. And then the second episode was, you know, red flags and things that are going on in the media, of why they're pushing a UFO agenda and what that could mean in different scenarios there. And then this episode tonight is about Samhain and breaching the veil. And this time of year, why it is so spiritually active and some of the history behind that so if that's a you know a topic that interests you then you know certainly stick around and share it around we appreciate your patience and uh sorry about the technical difficulties dan we are back again brother yeah here we are as per <laughs> usual something's wrong with my fucking internet but we 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 persevere we persevere well folks no, i think it's censorship i think it's like i think it's like targeted attacks and you know how like certain youtubers <laughs> will have their channelers like suspended or or deactivated because of the shit they talk about i think my whole house is under like <laughs> you know attack in terms of like oh there he goes again we got to do something to fuck with this shit well i i can't either you know agree or disagree with that because i can tell you that firsthand i experienced something very similar last year where all my stuff was just vamoosh gone just gone. years worth of work just vanished in seconds for nothing i never was told the reason as most of you out there know so i mean it's 
It's hard to say, honestly. I mean, there could be because I feel that that certainly was an attempt to silence me because That's I right. were never told the reason. And all of a sudden, boom, your accounts are all shut down. And luckily, I got at least, you know, this one back for the time being. But, uh, you know, if you're listening out there, folks, tonight's episode's on Samhain. Now, Samhain, you know, some people say Samhain because they don't know how it's pronounced. Samhain. It's Samhain. And Samhain is, is an Irish word that extends from a Gaelic festival that celebrates the month of November and it's celebrated on October 31st as the eve of Samhain um, going into the month of November. And what that celebrates is the end of harvest season and the end of longer days and shorter nights into the changeover of shorter days and longer nights, the darker period of the year, a time for reflection on what has been and to contemplate what shall be soon. And there's been so many different things over the years and mysteries and, and, and lore and tales. And it sparked what we know is All Hallows' Eve and Halloween and so much more. But it extends from pagan roots and it extends from Samhain. So we want to talk a little bit about this because, as I'm sure most of you've heard out there, you know, this time of year, the veil is thinner. And some of you might know what that means. Some of you might not. And why is it thinner? How do these tales come to be, you know? Is there truth behind that? So we're going to dive a little bit into it. I don't think this will be a long episode tonight. I think it will be shorter. Right. Uh, but if you guys have questions or concerns, you can feel free to you know comment wherever you're listening in from, and we will see it. We'll add it in to the show. We'll answer it as best as we can. Um, if you're listening on the radio, we won't see those comments. But you know anywhere else, we will. And uh, we'll go ahead and kind of jump into it. But you know. One of the things I wanted to start with is, you know, you hear about jack-o'-lanterns and costumes. You might say, well, where does some of this stuff co come from? I want to tell some cool stories that I know that uh, stem from history. Jack-o'-lanterns. So there's an old Irish tale that talks about Jack, a guy named Jack walking home one night after a night of gambling and drinking and partying. This was from a long, long time ago. And on his walk home, he has an encounter with the devil. No one knows exactly what was said during this conversation, but somehow during this conversation, you know, wanting to outsmart the devil because he must have been in fear of his life, he was able to get the devil to climb up a tree. And after he climbed up a tree, he marked the base of the tree with crosses, and the devil couldn't cross over the crosses, so he was stuck in a tree. So a bargain was made that he would remove the crosses and allow the devil to come back down as long as the devil promised that once he passed, that his soul would not go to hell. And that while he was here, he would be able to enjoy the pleasures of life. The devil agreed. So as the devil came back down and went back to his realm, Jack continued to live the rest of his life, enjoying the material pleasures of life, gambling and drugs and drinking and sex and all the things that we enjoy. And Jack eventually passed. Well, the devil kept his promise and did not allow Jack to go to hell. But he also couldn't go to heaven for all the things that he did on this earth. So he's stuck in this limbo realm. And it was very cold out this time of year. And he passed around this time of year, uh, around Halloween, around Sin Samhain. So the devil kind of in a mocking manner, as he was turned away from heaven and he went to try to go to hell. And the devil says, no, I'm keeping my promise. He threw him a coal and says, you can have that. Well, Jack picked up the coal and didn't know what to do with it, but he wanted to stay warm. His spirit needed to stay, you know, warm. He picked up a nearby turnip or gourd, hollowed it out and threw the coal inside of it. And its glow, he hovered around in the rest of his spiritual life. He wondered, still to this day, this earth carrying around a glowing jack-o'-lantern of heat to keep his spirit warm as he stayed in his purgatory state, the Purgatorian pit. That's where we get the tradition of jack-o'-lanterns and pumpkins. Now, added to this later on, that this night became something to celebrate spookiness and, and, and devils and demons and ghosts and things, they carved faces into these gourds or these pumpkins, but originally it stems from the heat emanating from this gourd, this coal from hell that kept Jack, the man who outwitted the devil, warm. So a lot of people did not probably know that. I think that's a really cool tell of, of this time of year and this season of where that story came from, that lore. And 
I, I always found that to be an enjoyable story. Yeah, that is cool. I, I oftentimes think in terms of history, I always get like really stuck into my own like quantum physics and metaphysics of how like, well, everything, you know, in the now moment just exists. It just is. There is no history and past, but I understand that we live in a linear reality of causality, cause and effect. And so there has to be like a, a an A to the B to the to the Z idea. And so I didn't particularly know that historical version of where the jack-o'-lanterns came from. That was new to me. Oh, awesome. Oh, yeah, it's a cool story. Like I said, kind of makes sense, too, because we call them pumping jack-o'-lanterns. Well, why? Because of Jack. And it was his, it was his lantern to walk through the cold night. So kind of where we got that from. And I think it's interesting, folks. I mean, when we look at Samhain in general, Christian hands got involved later on and, and wanted to demonize any type of pagan holidays. Now, they merged different holidays together and made All Saints Day and All Souls Day, which is celebrated at the very beginning of November. And then different things got changed around. We made All Hallows Eve and Halloween. Now, when they took the pagan festivals of Samhain, they kind of demonized it. And they said that whether it's true or not, once upon a time that the pagans were sacrificing humans and animals to the gods during this time of year because it was a frightful time. They went from fruitful harvest and, and sun and warmth and long days to all of a sudden the world changed and was cold and everything's dying around them. And they didn't quite understand things the way we do nowadays, so they felt the gods are angered. We have to appease them by giving them blood. Now, whether this really happened or not, it's hard to say because we know how much that Christianity has demonized a lot of different cultures and tried to make it something that you shied away from or, or kind of thought was repugnant in ways. Right. I don't believe that that was a popular thing. Was there people out there that did that? There very well might have been. I don't think that was a popular um, event that happened. But there was a heavy belief that on this night was the last night of the year that spirits it was a time that spirits were able to come through more easily but it was the last night of the year where spirits could come through and get retribution for any wrongdoings that anyone has done to them so people were scared and would stay inside their homes and lock themselves away because they were afraid that these spirits would come back and, and seek vengeance but also it started the idea that if we dress like them they'll leave us alone or won't even notice us so it became popular to dress as ghosts and spirits and the dead and demons and devils. And it became a popular thing where crowds would get together and celebrate this time of year, but were able to do so under the cover of a costume that they felt would allow them to blend in to the ethereal worlds that were now present in the material world and around us. So it was a way of being an incognito. And a lot of times people actually would carry around a white stag or horse with them like a fake horse because they could hold on to it and it would look like they were death themselves because behold a pale horse death rides in on a pale horse they would carry a, a white resemblance of a horse with them at these parties and they had these grand celebrations and these balls and these dances to celebrate this time of year because as i said it was a time of reflection for what has been and what will be how long till it's warm again will it forever be cold and we'll be stuck in this world like this or will the gods favor us and give us back warmth uh so it's really quite interesting how it was looked at and perceived um in all the different stories you'll notice a commonality and there's another one i'll tell here in a little bit i'll let dan jump in here in a minute but you notice the story of, of jack the jack and his lantern jack o lantern he met the devil on this time of year in the cold night he died this time of year and was given the the cool and he was a wandering spirit this time of year you have the balls and the dances where they're dressing up as the dead for the spirits are coming back to life you always have that common theme that this time of year there's devils demons and spirits around now, astrologically, you know, you will notice that there's a lot of changes that happen this time of year, and there is a very different feel to the the atmosphere around us. I mean, I I felt it already the last couple of weeks. You can feel a heavy yes. change, yes. not just not just it's cold or it's dark or sooner. No, you can literally, if you're sensitive, feel that there's just a massive shift of some sort that happens over a few week period. Now it's starting to kind of blend in where it doesn't feel so strong, but for a couple of weeks myself. 
I felt all out of sorts. I, I was feeling jacked up from the, the change. And it happens every year. Um, but Dan, what are your thoughts on this time of year? The thinning of the veil, why spirits might be coming through this time of year? Give me your input. Well, yeah, no, I was also going to ask you what your perception on the thinning of the veil was because um, I'm somebody who, in terms of like astrology, astronomy, anything like that, okay, well, there is a lot of validity to it. There's a lot of merit. There's a lot of people that actually base and build their whole lives around those tools and following those charts and what they mean for like in terms of things like Mercury retrograde, you know, certain planets in certain rotations and how those affect Earth and how those affect human consciousness. So just using that as an example, as a thread to connect the concept of this time of year of October, November, fall, All Hallows Eve, Halloween. OK, so the thinning of the veil. So then why do we think that's happening and what exactly are the effects of it? And it ties me back to astrology. Um, I often think that we as creator beings, as individuals, um, sometimes I refer to us as like nodes um, or like focal points or singularity points uh, in terms of quantum physics. We are all um, powerful creator beings. And what that means is I try to think less in terms of cause and effect and more of the fact of like, OK, well, is that planet affecting me or is the moon affecting me right now? Um, or is it where I'm at with my level of consciousness? Where am I at in my personal life? And how does it affect my abilities, any of my spirit, my spirit abilities? So with the thinning of the veils, I don't particularly have an answer as to why this time of year, this season, would would thin the veils that would blur the, the dimensions and the densities and the lines between different realms, different versions of realities. What I'm saying is I don't know why this time specifically is reserved for that type of um, heightened connectivity to spirit or other entities from other realms bleeding into ours much easier or maybe for the fact that like why do why do i feel why do i feel as daniel as a human why do i feel attracted to the idea of dressing up as a creature or a monster or a ghoul or something to that effect i always have as a little kid i've always been attracted to halloween to dressing up becoming a, a creature of the night and um but why so i'm i'm i'm, I'm asking all of these questions why now why halloween why october so I also know that in secret societies, breakaway civilizations, um, certain, you know, certain sub groups of practitioners, they also use not just Halloween and the thinning of the veils at this time of year to connect a spirit or to summon other entities, but also same as the moon cycles, same as astrology. Um, they oftentimes use like certain things like the lion's gate portal or the blood moons or the eclipses or the solstice those are all times of year that we assign this meaning to that we label as like a, a high point of energy like a similar to the way a ley line works geographically speaking so we, we we have these labels for certain celestial events or we have these labels for certain times of year that amplify the ability to do something okay so that's that's kind of like the point that i'm getting at but as a cause and effect reality and as a creator being, as myself or yourself, I actually think that we have the power to do whatever it is we need to do in terms of spirit contact or the amplification of energy or harnessing energy from a celestial body or from a planetary event or from the thinning of the veils during October. I think we can do this year round. I think it's a matter of our willpower. And then it almost just gets it almost for me, gets back to the semantics of using divination tools or spirit contact protocols or anything that we use as what I call as a permission, what I call a permission slip that gives us the power to, to contact spirit or use a portal system or manifest reality or amplify our intention the same way, the same way a divination tool works the same way I think the thinning of the veils works, but why are we assigning meaning to this time of year? Why are we assigning meaning with the ghouls and ghosts and goblins and creatures and entities from other dimensions? Why do we attach that to Halloween, to All Hallows Eve? Why this time of year? Why do we say that when Mercury's in retrograde, 
it negatively affects our electronics and our reality and we shouldn't make big changes in our life or we shouldn't like do certain things or go certain places because of this solstice event or this lion's gate so i'm actually opening a discussion with you freighter is like the why why do we assign meaning or, or in terms of the thinning of the veils of october why now why not why not january why not april why do we as as beings that exist here and now in the now moment that exist now in the now moment that we have access to these creator tools all the time as a result of our own free will what is significant about october and halloween what is significant about the lion's gate portal in august what is significant about the solstice in june do you know what i'm getting at why now i think i mean there's several things that i think play a factor into why um I, I certainly think the zodiacal wheel and the archons which are the the planetary bodies i think that they do have a very strong hold on humanity and our consciousness and yep. as they change they do change things within us so as we feel the change of the season and the planetary changes we physically feel most of us something switch and you actually okay. can feel that influence on us so i think that plays a part of it that it's a natural cycle made by the demiurge to okay. create this these changes for whatever reason it needs to okay. change throughout the year certain ways as, as a mechanism it's a stage and it's setting up for the next scene now i, I can see that, that now i think a big part of it is too with this time of year there's a lot of death there's a lot of shedding and that can be very important for spirits because spirits need nourishment and food to be able to feed off of in order to energize themselves to be more present in our material world so as the flowers are dying and either going to come back next year if they're if they're annual flowers or they need to be replanted because they actually die you have these flowers and these plants dying you have the leaves falling off the trees and the trees going from vibrant lush green trees to dead withered branches all of this death is a i don't want to say worldwide because some places are tropical but for the most part a, whole, a big chunk of the world or this earth dies and drops to the ground and is a massive nourishment to spiritual energy to be able to show itself this time of year okay i see that i, th I think that another couple of reasons would be for the places that do get cold in winter time that for the spirits of the dead as someone who you know investigates paranormal you know phenomena a lot of times certain classes of beings do make a coldness in the room so even if it's a hot day you'll feel the weather change and the coldness come you know what i'm saying and if it's already cold i believe that it makes it easier for these spirits to come through because what happens is it's not necessarily that how can i explain this it's not necessarily that their presence just makes it cold it can but what really is happening is the dimensional shift from their realm to ours breaks through such a quick barrier that there is a atmospheric change which brings coldness okay um it, and when it's already cold i think it allows for that transitional doorway to to activate a little more uh, easily. amplify like it a amplifies. conductor exactly it's more of a, a conductive or conducive uh, state to be able to do that the other thing i would say is that the human psyche this time of year takes a shift so we from all the stories of time have always had a fear since the beginning of winter of the changing of season fear is a great amplifier to cause phenomena to happen right and sorrow and depression which happens with the long cold seasons and not some people don't have a lot to do during the winter so instead of being out and about and being an active body they sit in their house all winter they're depressed they're sad i mean how many people the the suicide rates obviously heavily amplified during winter yeah. time that's right i think that if you mix the cold weather which is a great foreground for spirits to be able to come through more easily the celestial bodies lining up for more power to be in the air to feed off of that dead energy our human psyche giving off fear and sorrow and sadness it all lays the perfect stage for this explosion of spiritual content to come through so is okay it, see that is makes it, sense is it that the vin the, the veil actually is thinner and that's why they're coming through or is it a mixture of astrological, psychological, and material changes that just bring the perfect culmination yeah. for spirits to come through? I one think thing I, that's more like it. 
I like one thing you said, if I can try to uh, interpret Absolutely. it properly. Um, I like that you said about, okay, the changing of the season and the way that, you know, weather and the cold can actually have psychological effects on us as individuals. And that gets me back to my point is like, we are creator beings. Our perception, our witness of reality is what gives it existence. It's what gives it shape and form and power. Like everything is, is a, is a reflection of our own consciousness in a sense. So if in terms of causality, cause and effect, if nature itself and the changing of the seasons has a psychological, physiological effect on us as humans, then as our own creator abilities amplify, uh, our perception of that of which is hidden oftentimes, um, can maybe heighten can hone in, can become stronger, and we ourselves, almost like as a power source, can fuel the ability for of the perception of spirit during this time. I that agree. our perception it, it expands, our ability to perceive that of what's which is all always there, anyways, increases this time of year. So, in a sense, maybe there is, in a sense, maybe there's no veil thinning. Only our perception gets stronger and faster and sharper to see that of which is always there. Well, because we're expecting it. I mean, like I said before, and I'll share a story if I may. Please um, do. You know, as I said, from the beginning of time, it seems like we've always kind of explained stories of the seasonal change in diabolical ways or in ways that were a little bit more dark and, and macabre. Yes, the and symbolism. Yeah. It, it's always been there. So let's take a look at the Greek uh, story of Persephone. Now, Persephone is the daughter of Demeter and Zeus. Demeter and Zeus are brother and sister, but they're also consorts with one another. And they have Persephone, their daughter. Zeus promises Hades, the, the, the god of the underworld, his daughter's hand, Persephone. It's like an arranged marriage. He doesn't tell her. He doesn't tell Demeter, the mother. He just tells Zeus, or excuse me, tells um, Hades, you can take my daughter's hand. Mm -hmm. uh, Persephone's laying in a field, relaxing, a field of flowers. It's beautiful. It's it's summertime. And out of the ground busts a giant opening. And out of it comes a chariot. And here's Hades riding on his chariot with his horses. He scoops up Persephone and he goes down to the underworld. Now, Zeus doesn't tell anybody. And, and Demeter's wondering where her daughter is. She can't find her. She's worried. She's freaking out. She's looking everywhere. And she talks to some of the other spirits and gods. And, and where is my daughter at? And one of the other spirits says, I didn't see her, but I could hear her cries from the distance. And she was taken. She goes to Helios, the god of the sun. And because of his stature in the sky, he says, I seen it all. You know, Hades came and took Persephone to the underworld. She goes to Queen Hecate, the goddess of witchcraft, and asks for her help to try to get her daughter back. But in her lamenting time period, Demeter is the is the goddess of harvest and of of fruitful, you know, plants and everything that comes along with harvesting. So in her sorrow and depression for her daughter being gone, she lets everything die. And for the first time in history, the plants die. The sun goes away. It gets dark. It gets cold. As the plants die unexpectedly and no one's saving up the grain properly, thousands of people die. So now you have this switch from summer and beautiful time period to just a fall into darkness. And they start talking about the fact that, uh, you know, this is this is bad. You know, there's people dying everywhere. She's depressed. She finds out that her brother and her consort Zeus is the one who promised her daughter away. And she sends um, Hermes to go down and, and try to retrieve her daughter and get her back. They go down and they talk Hades into letting her go, telling him that, you know what, we know you wanted her hand, but because of this back on the surface realm, people are dying everywhere. The world's become cold. Plants are dying. It's a dark period for humanity. And he promises to let her go. No, that's only after he entices her with pomegranates because, and some people don't understand the symbolism of the story. Once Persephone eats the pomegranate, he lets her leave to go calm her mother down to let her know she's okay and to get the world back to the way it needs to be. The reason and the symbolism of the pomegranate is once you eat any fruit of the land of the dead, you can never leave the land of the dead. So some people say, I don't understand the story. He just randomly offers her a pomegranate. He offers her a pomegranate because as she eats the pomegranate, 
this fruit of harvest, she is now forever owned by the land of the dead. So she does return here. She comforts her mother. But Hermes tells her, well, you can never fully leave the land of the dead. And for one third, and Zeus gets involved as well, one third of the year, you have to spend in the underworld and the other two thirds of the year you can spend on the surface with your family and your loved ones. Now, what this is some symbolic of, folks, is the fact that one third of the year, the world is in winter. We're in the cold stage. And the other two thirds is the spring. And Persephone became known as the goddess of spring. She comes out of the underworld and the flowers bloom in spring. The fruits grow. The harvest comes in. It's great. And after her two thirds of the year, she descends back into the underworld with her consort Hades. And the world goes cold again with always the promise that she will return back and the world return to the way that it is. But once again, folks, we have these, these, these tells of underworld and the spirits coming through. We have the tells of Hades, who's symbolic or representative of the devil, some people would say, because he's the god of the underworld, though he's not really a Satan-type character. Um, so it's just interesting, and it, it goes back to the Mesopotamian descent of Anana, where she goes into the underworld and sheds a piece of clothing at every one of the seven gates until she's naked at the end because she stripped away her ego into the underworld and returns a true goddess. There's all these repeating stories that talk about the going into the underworld and coming back, the dark period into the light, why there needs to be this darkness. So it's kind of implanted and ingrained into the collective unconscious of, of humanity. So even if back then it was only because they didn't really understand these things fully or made these myths and lore to explain what was going on around them, which we have to understand to a modern person, they look at this lore and these myths and they're like, Oh, they're so fanciful and crazy. And right. that's how they explained life at that time, what they were going through. If it was a period of bad, horrible things, their stories were very dark and malicious. If it was very joyous, wonderful times, their stories were all about, you know, joy and love and sex and lust. And they, they always explained their world here on earth in fanciful stories of their gods and goddesses. But right. when you when you go throughout history, that gets ingrained on the collective unconscious cloud of humanity. So every generation that's born without knowing it has ingrained in them mm -hmm. pieces of the collective unconscious. So we always understand there's this dark, spooky time of year. There's this change in the season, something I need to be afraid of, something I need to be weary of. And as Daniel said, we are the gods of our world in our own ways. We are fractals of the God force energy. We are creators just as we were created. Right. And when we have these, you know, notions going into something, what it's going to be like, what we expect, and we use our will and our power, whether we know it or not, we create it. So when you mm -hmm. have billions of people around the planet thinking it's the dark time and the time for spirits and darkness and ghouls and goblins, we create ghouls and goblins and spirits and devils. And that's what runs this world. Now, I think it's done for two very important reasons. The church played a hand in this. You could say that the church would never want us to be into all this because it's against a lot of, especially extreme, you know, Catholics and things. They don't even celebrate Halloween. They're against it. There's members of my family growing up that uh, they did not like the fact that my mom and, and, and my brothers and I, we all celebrated Halloween. They thought that was blasphemy. Sure. But, you know, I think that it's actually a part of the church's plan. So for one, you have pagans still celebrating their their culture and celebrating this and dressing up as ghouls and goblins because we once thought that that was the way to not be harmed but then we just kind of embraced it we like doing that it's fun but i also think that that's a way we keep the heritage going we do celebrate and it is an active time of year i do very extensive ritual every year for devil's night which is the night before halloween or right. Samhain. and it's very powerful but i also think the church likes the fact that we do this because it gives them the time of year that there are people running around in madness and running around as devils, which they can use to say, look at these heathens. Look at these people celebrating this holiday. There is paranormal activity and unexplained supernatural phenomena that they can attribute to the devil and say, this is the time of the devil. This is the time that you need to repent and pray harder than ever, come together more than ever. So it kind of caters to both sides of that wheel the extremely religious God fearing people who want to shun away from this, but need it because 
as, as Anton LaVey once said, the devil was the best friend the church ever had. Without him, they would be meaningless. Mm -hmm. So they need that. So Halloween is an important time to build that culture, but it's also an important time for us to actually embrace it and celebrate it. No, that's very well said, and I, I, I completely agree. Do you by chance, not to get too conspiratorial, but do you by chance know much about anything that like secret societies do in terms of their own rituals? Um, un unlike maybe the type of work that you do, but the type of stuff that they do on things like, you know, blood moons and celestial body dates and the thinning of the veils and, and devil's night, or do you know anything about the type of things that secret societies would do or in what way they're exercising their sort of abilities to in, in the energy of it being amplified the way that we discussed do you know anything about that so the story of um persephone and zeus and hades and demeter and all of that um that actually sparked that story became a very very popular occult mythos which mm -hmm. led to what some people will know as the Eleusinian mysteries there was the Eleusinian cults and every year around this time they performed the Eleusinian mysteries where they actually enacted and played out the, I don't want to say kidnapping, but the right. kidnapping of Persephone, the journey into the underworld, the rescuing of her and the eating of the fruit to shed who she was into who she would become, the returning back to life again. And that's actually a common um common thing amongst most cults um you know when you look at and even we do popular things that most people don't realize so let's let's take aside the eleusinian mysteries and the greek mysteries was something very big and practiced they also said during the eleusinian mysteries um as a complete side note that they believe that they heavily indulged in hallucinogenics mm -hmm. so they they made a giant feast that everyone ate during these ritual celebration but they also drank the nectar of the gods and they drank these hallucinogenic drinks and had orgiastic ceremonies and and it just ha had a great time i wish i could go back and join them now <laughs> You know, one of the things that, you know, is, is very popular nowadays that most people don't realize is Freemasonry. Every right. town that you go to in America, pretty much, if you drive through, you'll see a sign on the road side of the road to say everywhere Masonic Lodge somewhere. Now, I got three of them, of them in my small town. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of Masonic Lodges out there. Um, now, I'm not saying that all the Masons are into this because a lot of them are just into it for brotherhood, to be a part of an well, organization, to help community. It depends on the level. Yes. And as you get to further levels, especially certain groups of Masonic lodges, and you have groups out there like the Odd Fellows, which you don't hear a lot of, but the Odd Fellows were another fraternal order um, of, of occultists. They, one of the big things that they do is they enact the journey into the underworld and death. And they will strip you of everything before your ceremony. No wedding rings on, no jewelry on, no clothes on, no cell phone. You are stripped naked. And you were thrown into a casket and buried. And then they dig you up. They open up the casket and you emerge into the world as a grown man. But that symbolizes the death of yourself and the birthing of a new self. The shedding of who you were, the animal-based self, into this higher spiritual being. You emerge from the coffin as you emerge from the womb, naked and new, with nothing on you. And then they give you the robe that you put on and the adornments that you wear as a new brother of the Masonic Lodge at higher degrees. And you worship in front of the giant G. Most people say that's God. Or they celebrate that as Gnosis. Or as the generative principle. Um, some people actually say that Masons uh, worship Lucifer. There's there's heavy um, ties to that. Now, that would be another cult that's out there that certainly celebrates those things. It doesn't have to ne necessarily be this time of year, but it's still a ceremony. is very representative of those ancient pagan ceremonies where there was a darkness after the light, before the dawning of a new light, a new year, a new season. Because pagans look at this and witch, witches look at this as All Hallows Eve or Samhain is the witches and pagans new year. We don't celebrate it on December 31st or January 1st. We celebrate it on October 31st because as we wake up November 1st, it is a new witches year. So it's cold for a while, but then 
as we flip over into the next year, which for us is still the same year. It's confusing. Spring happens, a new birthing, a new self, a chance to be a new you. And a lot of ancient cults and practitioners out there have adapted that in one form or another. And some of them might have absolutely no idea that it's an adaptation of, of that. That makes sense. I was curious what your perspective is. And I think that there are also other secret societies that we know nothing about that probably use times like this thinning of the veils to do um, probably more horrible things that would get us banned on YouTube. So I won't say them out loud. That's okay. I'll <laughs> them out there. I won't go too deep into it, but this time of year, folks, as I said for myself personally, um, I do on devil's nights, October 30th, every single year, a very extensive demonic ritual and pact. Um, I do other ones throughout the year as well, but this is a very special time for me. It's my favorite ritual of the year. Um, mm. I, I prepare for it pretty heavily, and it's a time where I reintegrate my structures that I've already put into place. So very similar to and reminiscent of what we already talked about, where I reflect on what has been, and I envision what is to come. Mm -hmm. Restrengthen my packs with the spirits that I work with. I thank them and give them a feast and an offering. So a very elaborate feast and offering mm -hmm. and a banquet. It is me with a full-blown Thanksgiving feast for my spiritual counterparts as a thank you for what they have provided and a contribution to what is to come, but a restructuring and strengthening of the pact and any new, any new changes that need to be made on the pact is made. And that is everything from food, like I said, to liquid libation offerings, candles and incense, to blood offerings so i mean it is something that is is very involved and deep um but it is a very very potent time of year to be doing so and then after i am done i am dancing <laughs> you know with the devil in the pale moon light um in the cemetery and i, I won't say where because i don't need anybody sure. trying to hinder my shit, but you will find me late late into the evening on devil's night dancing in the graveyard with the dead and it is a very important and powerful and very, very pivotal thing for me personally. And um, I, I think it's something that there's a lot of fruit to be to be grasped from that because it is always very powerful and it always sets forward for a very powerful new structure of the next year. Okay, so then I'll, I'll, I'll end tonight's episode with a question that I'm just curious to hear what someone like you would say to it because it's how my mind works all the time please all year round is there something you can do or something that you might be able to change or a different exercise or a different practice where you can make that same connection and give that same respect and also yield the same results at any moment of any day that doesn't have to be special like october 29th or october 31st or the thinning of the veils or on any celestial body date but can you recreate that same honor respect and also yield the same rewards of doing those things at any moment and anywhere is there a way for you to, in a sense, almost not need this particular time of year for the same results? That's what I'm asking. I think absolutely. I mean, a part of my practice is this is common throughout the year. So giving a feast, giving blood, giving liquid libation is part of the normal practice. I think that we place personally as humans we like to place value on things and specialize things that's so what i'm saying it, it can be march 20th it that's can be it can be june 17th and, and you still have a very powerful result still give the feast still have life-changing phenomena that happens absolutely yeah but it's almost like it's almost like you know valentine's day mm -hmm. every day we should love our lover Every right. day we should tell them we love them and, and cherish them. And, and and I hope that you do. But mm -hmm. that day is something that we symbolize as special. So that day love is in the air because everyone's buying everyone else flowers and chocolates and teddy bears and doing all these things and going out on dates. So it puts something in once again to the collective unconscious or to the consciousness of humanity as being the special day and more love is in the air than normal. And, and, and in a way that's true. 
but it's no different than any other day. We might, you know, tell someone that more, but you know, unconsciously we're telling our partner all the time. We love them. If you, if, if your wife or your husband or your partner, or whoever knows you love them, it doesn't need to be said. It's just said more on That's that right. day. So I think, and it's just like father's day or mother's day. I mean, every day I'm a father. Every day I'm a great father. Every day I love my kids and my kids love me. So Father's Day isn't necessarily special, but it's one of those days that it feels special because it's a day to celebrate you. So it's it's like that with the spirits and especially with the darker pagan spirits, the devils and the demons. Now, like I said, a lot of times the pagan spirits, they weren't devil worshipers, folks. That's where the, the misconception is, is you know, Samhain was just an ending of season and a celebration of November. And yes, they might've had other gods, but we look at it and we look at it as like, oh, they were like these old demon and devil worshipers, or we're told that they were. Chances are they were not. That's more of, of people like myself. The, I, I do worship the devil and I do do devil rituals during this time of year as I find it fruitful. But sure. we've just built this, this idea that it's this time of year special. But it, like I said, because so many people believe it is, think it is, fear that it is, love that it is it becomes and right and that that's a topic we've talked about a lot in the past yeah. about the concept of egregors yep you know how like collective thought and um focus collective focus mass consensus focus and thought actually creates reality it's amplified very much so when a lot of people a whole communities whole societies are focused on the same fear or the same you know um premonition the same expectation of of something that was told to us that can happen or will then you get a lot of collective focus on that thing and it becomes a reality. Well, and the thing is, is really that is what spirituality in a sense, and I hate to use the word spirituality because that can be taken different ways. Spirituality can be finding yourself, which it really is. Sure. But I'm saying, yes. let, let me say like religion or ritual or things of that nature. What it is, is really just the working with egregoric spirits or thought forms. Because when we, we look at things like Saturn, the god Saturn, who is also right. Satan, who is right. also Kronos, who is right. also all these other spirits. These are different cultures understanding very real currents that exist in this world, yep. in this reality that they've given name to, form to, mm -hmm. lore and mythos to, and addressing. Right. It, it's, it's decorating the cake. Everybody has the cake. The cake exists, folks. But how do you decorate your cake to understand it? And that's what we do. And egregores are really, uh, you know, that, I mean, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. So I've talked about before, and I'll throw this out there real quick, folks, is kind of towards the end of this. Lucifer. Lucifer never existed. Lucifer was never a fallen angel. It was never a spirit in the sense that the, the Jews and the Christians believe in the world now as, as a mass consensus believes it was a, isn't that amazing it was a misconception in the original Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek there what it didn't say Lucifer it did not talk about an angel at all and once upon a time one of the bishops translated them into Latin which was the officialized language of the Catholic Church. They created the book called the Vulgate, which was the Latinized translation of the Old Testament. So you have the Torah, you have the Tanyak, you have the Septuagint, and then they created the Vulgate. These are different languages, understandings of the Hebraic Torah, the Old Testament, the first five books of Moses. And when they translated it, Phosphore, phosphorus, they translated it into, you know, morning star, the light. They transferred it into the Latinized word was Lucifer or Lucifer. Now, people took that as being, oh, how you have fallen, great Lucifer, son of the dawn. Have you fallen, great Lucifer? Well, oh, that's a being. And they started thinking it was a uh -huh. angel and all. And then John Milton in Paradise Lost, which is a very famous story, made it more popular by talking about how he was a fallen angel and he was the leader of hell and he was Satan himself. And it created this pop yeah, it gets culture. Yeah, distorted and embellished, and, distorded and embellished. Yep, and over time and over time in pop culture these days with movies and books and all of these other things, Lucifer is real. I know many practitioners who have conjured 
Lucifer, who have had beings show up in their temple as Lucifer, who has talked to them. They've seen physical forms, who's made great changes in their life, who have struck down their enemies. All of these amazing things were done by this egregoric spirit. Does it make it any less phenomenal? Does it make it any less powerful? Absolutely not. No. But what it is, is the human mind, the human will, giving a dressing to natural powers and bringing it to life. We are the puppeteers. Right. We control the strings, folks. And yes. that's all it is. When you summon Satan, you're summoning a dark current of dark energy. You're giving it the dressing of Satan or Satanus, or Samael, or Azazel, or Beelzebub, or Iblis, Saturn, Kronos. It doesn't matter, folks. These right. are different dressings of the same current. They are what's called the deific masks. They are the same currents with different dressings on. You can drown in any river. You just give it different right. names and you drown in the same river. So it's, it's very interesting. So I believe, yes, our thoughts create our reality, as you said, Daniel. And I think that this time of year, because of history and because of our fears, as we've talked about, we create in correlation with the lunar cycles. Absolutely. We create a very big stage for a beautiful, beautiful play. I love, I love that you said that, and that ties everything together beautifully, and I'm glad that we were able to both add our perspectives on those things. So let's say this then to all the listeners, any audience members now, anybody that might hear this after the fact, in between now and Halloween, in between now and Devil's Night, go to the Celestial Oddities Facebook group, which Freder and I both are uh, moderators and we're involved in there and we read everything, and post what sort of rituals do you have even if it's not like any sort of particular seance or you're using any divination tools or anything like that, but is there something that you like to do unique to you that you'd like to share? Maybe you work with, you know, candles and crystals and incense and sage, and maybe you work, you know, more so with the direction of things that freighters does. Maybe you like to dress up in something ceremonial, or maybe you just like to play the Halloween game. Whatever it is that resonates with you, that you feel significant about this time of year and the thinning of the veils, go ahead and share that with us. I would love to read what you do and, and why you find this time of year significant. Yes, please do, because I mean, it can be great for many things, whether you're doing traditional ritual of any different type of any different entity, or whether you're just doing spiritual meditation. It is a powerful time right. of year. And one of the ancient practices I'll throw out there as a last thing for me, was as Daniel mentioned earlier, divination. Divination was very popular this time of year because obviously as the veil is supposedly thinner, you're able to tap into other worlds. It was a time that a lot of people used to bring forth that spiritual energy. And what people did in ancient times was stare into a reflective service and scry yes. for their lover yes. and ask the spirits out there to show them the image of the man or the woman that they were meant to That's wed. Right. And they would see these reflections this from the spiritual world mm -hmm. of their consort that they would end up with. And then eventually it led into, I want to see if I'm able to do this. I want to see the passing of my loved one. I want to see my grandfather or my wife or my husband or my child. And then they started showing up on the reflective mirror. And once again, is that them showing up or is that you bringing them to life and them showing up? It doesn't fucking matter at the end of the day. If it's powerful, it's powerful. But this time of year doesn't have to be rituals to the devil or to the gods. It can simply be you with candlelight flanked on each side of a reflective mirror or bowl of water. And you stare into it, go into a trance-like state, clear your mind, and allow your intention to come forward. And you would be amazed at the wild and wonderful things that will happen. Yes, I agree. I'd say do it, do it, do it in between now and Halloween and then post about it in, in our Facebook group. Yes, please. Celestial Oddities Pair of Normal Guys Facebook group page. Leave us any questions or concerns. Leave us your rituals that you do and any experiences that you experience and any uh, upcoming ideas that you want to see us bring forward on the show. Other than that, uh, Daniel, any last words? No. Uh, everybody, thank you very much for your patience with my internet my fucking trash garbage internet <laughs> but we will persevere we are here regardless and um freighter what is next episode about next ep what do we got for them? we got dun, dun, dun. it is going to be on thursday october 26th right before halloween we have interview with jamie and jenny king um, which is are the founders of the Bigfoot Field Evidence Evaluation Team and 
contact meditations, a CE5 close encounter of the fifth kind human initiation protocol. We met Jamie and Jenny at the Hillcon Paranormal Convention a couple years ago at uh, Hillview Manor in Pennsylvania. That's right. Wonderful couple. They go out and do a lot of lectures and presentations. They're constantly in the field doing work and going out there and uh, teaching people. And we, we just really connected with them. And we said, someday we're going to have you on our show. Well, that day has come, folks. And you can check them out on the 26th, 830 to 10 p.m. on a detailed interview with the two of them. So make sure you check that out. We have a lot of other great, uh, you know, conversations coming up between Daniel and I deep diving into content, other interviews coming up throughout the year. And I think what Daniel and I will do is the episode after these these two on the 26th will be a call in episode. I think we will do yeah. our famous call in episodes. So if you're out there, you've had an experience and an encounter, something unexplained, you just want to pick our brains on something, we will open the airwaves up. And this time with the video, we can do it a little bit differently. I think it's going to be fun. We can bring you guys on, hear what you have to say, and we'll have a nice uh, connection with our fans out there. So stay tuned for that. And other than that, guys, as always, it has been a pleasure. And uh, we will see you on the 26th. Celestial Oddities, pair of normal guys, signing out. Thanks, guys. <laughs>